Hello everyone. Let's analyze. So let's consider the sequence that's obtained by taking two convergent sequences and splicing them together. What do I mean? Well, we know from a previous set of notes that the sequence 1 over n converges to 0. We also know from an in-class assignment that the sequence 2n plus 1 divided by 3n minus 1 converges to 2 thirds. So, if we let a n be one of those convergence sequence entries when n is even, and the other sequence entries of a convergent sequence when n is odd, then the limits of those two sequences we put together are not limits, limits of a n. It's not right to say that either 0 or 2 thirds is a limit of the sequence a n. But they both behave like limits. Well, every neighborhood of 0 contains an infinite number of sequence entries of a n. It specifically contains an infinite amount of even entries, right? The entries 1 over n. But we also know that every neighborhood of two-thirds also contains an infinite number of entries of a n. Specifically contains all but, uh, all but a finite number of the odd entries of a n, right? Because the odd entries converge to two-thirds. So they behave like limits, but of course they're not like limits because neither neighborhood contains all but a finite amount of entries. Right? In fact, there are neighborhoods of zero and neighborhoods of two-thirds that are disjoint and both contain an infinite amount of entries, which means neither contains all but a finite amount. Therefore, neither zero nor two-thirds is a limit. But certainly they seem special, right? If I take the set of all sequence entries, certainly 0 and 2 thirds stand out. So let's call them something. So let S be a set of real numbers. Okay. Then a real number A is an accumulation point of S if, and only if, every neighborhood of A contains infinitely many points of S. So as an example, let's consider the set that contains all the sequence entries a n. Well, both 0 and 2 thirds are accumulation points. As we just discussed, any neighborhood of 0 contains an infinite amount of even entries of a n which are all elements of S. Similarly, every neighborhood of two-thirds contains an infinite amount of odd entries of a n, which are all elements of S. Therefore, every neighborhood of zero contains an infinite amount of elements of S. Every neighborhood of two-thirds contains an infinite amount of entries of S. Therefore, they are, by definition, accumulation points. Note that it's straightforward to say that the limit of a convergent sequence is always an accumulation point. So anytime we have a sequence that converges, and we take those sequence entries and consider them as elements of a set, the limit of that sequence is an accumulation point. And that follows directly from the neighborhood definition of a limit, that every neighborhood of a limit contains all but a finite number of sequence entries. The next subject is the bolzano weierstrass theorem, which says every bounded infinite set of real numbers has at least one accumulation point. 
every bounded infinite set of real numbers has at least one accumulation point. Now, let's notice that if this is true, and it is because it says theorem, and we're going to prove it, but we haven't proved it yet, so if it's true, bolzano weierstrass actually implies that this set must have at least one accumulation point, and in fact we've proved it has two, specifically zero and two-thirds. We can say that it has at least one because this set is bounded. Right? Every entry of the set is positive, so it's bounded below by zero. The even entries are bounded above by one, and the odd, the odd entries are must be less than three, So how are we going to prove that every bounded infinite set of real numbers has at least one accumulation point? Now, when I say an infinite set of real numbers, I mean uh, infinite in the amount of elements. Okay, so it has an infinite number of elements. So here's the idea. Let's talk through the idea of the proof. And then we'll go through carefully uh, and give a formal proof. But let's make sure that we understand the idea. And after we talk through the idea, it might be worthwhile for you to pause the video and reread and rethink through the idea. The better you understand the idea, the more clear the formal proof will be to you. So here's the idea. Since the set is bounded, it can be bracketed by an infimum and a supremum. And all of the set's infinite numbers are sandwiched between the infimum and supremum. Now, we can take that interval from inf to sup, cut it in half, and then we have two intervals, the union of which contains all the entries of s. Therefore, one of those two intervals must contain an infinite number of entries. Whichever interval it is, let's take that and cut it in half. One of those intervals must contain an infinite number of entries of s. Whichever one it is, let's take it and cut it in half. One of those intervals must also contain an infinite number of entries of s. We can continue doing this forever, which means we can actually build an interval arbitrarily small that contains an infinite number of the elements of s by repeatedly cutting the interval inf to soup in half. What's the accumulation point in that case? Well, the accumulation point is going to be the supremum of the set of left interval limits as we carry out this halving process. And we'll prove that. So again, if that idea made crystal clear sense to you, carry on. If it's a little bit fuzzy, please pause here, reread the idea, and think through it. And then, carry on. So the proof. Well, we have an infinite set of real numbers. Let's give it a name. Let's call it... S. Since S is bounded, we know by the least upper bound axiom that it has a supremum. And by a theorem that follows from this axiom that you read about in your textbook, it also has an infimum. So let A not be the infimum and let B not be the soup. S is contained in the closed interval A not to B not. Let C be the midpoint then either that half interval a not to c or c to b not contains an infinite number of elements of s. One of them has to, right? because s itself has an infinite number of elements, and s is contained in the union of these two half intervals. So define a1, b1 to be the interval with an infinite number of intervals.
I'm sorry, with an infinite number of elements of S. That's a typo. That should say elements of S. Forgive me. I will correct it and post it online. Now, since the interval a1 to b1 also contains an infinite number of elements of s, it can be cut in half as well. And one of those intervals contains an infinite number of elements of s. Well, we'll call that interval a2, b2. Perhaps I should have called the inf r and the sup d, in which case the interval would have been r2, d2. That's an opportunity lost, and I regret that. If we continue this process forever, we'll build an infinite number of nested intervals. In other words, a n plus 2 to b n plus 2 is contained in a n plus 1 to b n plus 1, which is contained in a n to b n, which is contained in a n min minus 1 to b n minus 1, which is contained in a 2 d b 2, which is contained in a 1 b 1, which is contained in our original Infosup interval, A0 to B0. Because these intervals are nested, and by the way, let's just stop here and recognize that we're essentially carrying out a bisection algorithm. Very similar to what we did in a previous lecture when we were searching for the square root of 2. Okay, for every natural number n, a0 is less than or equal to A1, which is less than or equal to A2, which is less than or equal to uh, An, which is less than or equal to An plus minus 1, I'm sorry, An plus 1, which is less than or equal to Bn plus 1, which is less than or equal to Bn, which is less than or equal to Bn minus 1, which is less than or equal to B1, which is less than or equal to B0. Again, this sequence of inequalities follows from the fact that our entries are, our intervals are nested. Okay, These nested intervals are contained inside of the previous interval, specifically it's half the distance, and each of these intervals contains an infinite number of elements of S. As I just said, each interval is half the length of the previous. Therefore, the distance of Bn to An is half the distance of Bn minus 1 to An minus 1. And since this dif difference is half the difference of Bn minus 2 to An minus 2, this is equal to two intervals previous divided by 2 squared, which is equal to the original interval of nth to soup divided by 2 to the n. That means the difference between bn and an can be made to be arbitrarily small because 2 to the n can be made to be arbitrarily large. More specifically for any epsilon, there exists an L Right? a natural number L for which the distance BL minus AL is less than epsilon. Because remember, BL minus AL is the interval B0 minus A0 halved L times. Right? So B0 minus A0 divided by 2 to the L right, can be made less than epsilon if I pick L correctly. Now let's define A as the supremum of the bounded set of all left interval points. Right? Remember I have these nested intervals A n to B n. Right? So let me take all my A n's for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And that gives me a set of infinite numbers. But the set of infinite numbers is bounded because they're all contained in the interval A naught to B naught. And since I have a bounded set, a supremum must exist, and I'm going to name that supremum big A. Okay. 
So we're going to prove that A is an accumulation point of S. From our alternative theorem for supremum, we know there exists an element of this set, right, of all left points, we'll say AM, for which this is true. That follows from the alternative definition for supremum. Do you remember that one? Let's bring it up using our special snap technology. Specifically this theorem, which gave us an alternate definition of a supremum, which is that a supremum is an upper bound, and if I subtract any epsilon from my upper bound, there's an element of my set larger than it. Oh, what is the special snap technology, you ask? Well, I've arranged the notes so that if you snap when a theorem is cited, it'll automatically take you to that theorem. Go ahead and try it. Let us snap now and go back. So did you try it? Huh, didn't work? That's weird. It works for me. See? So therefore we know that there's an element of my set of left endpoints sandwiched between A and A minus epsilon for any arbitrary epsilon. I can find such an M. Now let P be the larger number of L or M. Right? There's only two numbers, one of them has to be larger unless they're equal, in which case P is either. Well then, if P is the maximum of L or M, then P is necessarily greater than or equal to AM. That is, AP is greater than or equal to AM. That comes from our nested property here, specifically this side. A is bigger than AP because A is an upper bound. So it's bigger than every entry of our sequence. And AM is larger than A minus epsilon from the alternative definition of the supremum. And AP is larger than or equal to AM. Furthermore, BP minus AP equals, from applying our formula here, which we developed here, BP minus AP is equal to our original interval length of infimum to soup divided by 2 to the P. And if P is bigger than L, then this is less than B naught minus A naught divided by 2 to the L. which is less than epsilon. Right? Remember, L is the natural number that guarantees that this is less than epsilon. That's what we assumed here. So, let's take our conclusions and put them together. Let's notice that inequality 4, that BP minus AP, is less than epsilon. Well then if I add AP to both sides, the invariance under addition implies that BP is less than AP plus epsilon. AP is less than A because A is an upper bound. Therefore AP plus epsilon is less than A plus epsilon. And of course by transitive quality BP is less than A plus epsilon. So, putting our conclusions together, AP is less than BP 
Well, why is that? Well, because the interval AP to BP is an interval that goes left to right because we're taking our interval nth to soup, which is not equal because if they were equal, then that means our original set only had one entry. So it's an AP and BP are not equal, and BP is an upper bound, and A naught to lower bound initially, or A naught and B naught are up. A naught to lower bound and B naught is an upper bound. And we're cutting these intervals in halves. B N and is always to the right of A N for every number. That's why this inequality is true. This inequality follows from the transitive property applied to this series of inequalities. AP is greater than A minus epsilon follows from the transitive property applied to this series of inequalities. Well, if AP to BP is contained or sandwiched between A minus epsilon and A plus epsilon, that implies that the interval a minus epsilon to A plus epsilon, which we have previously named the epsilon neighborhood of A, contains the interval AP to BP, which contains an infinite number of entries of S. As epsilon was an arbitrary positive number, and every neighborhood of A contains, for some epsilon, an epsilon number neighborhood of A, which contains the interval AP to BP for some sufficiently large P which contains an infinite number of elements of S, we've shown that every neighborhood of A contains an infinite number of elements of S. That's all for today. Are you still there? Oh, I see. You're still on the edge of your seats, wondering whether every Cauchy sequence, sequence is also convergent. Well, to find the answer to that, you'll have to stay tuned. Oh, you're still there? Okay, okay. I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. Is every Cauchy sequence bounded? Well, think about it for a second. In fact, think about it longer because it's on your homework. If every Cauchy sequence is bounded and it's an infinite sequence, therefore corresponds to a set with an infinite number of elements, we just shown that that set has to have at least one accumulation point. If we can show that that set has only one accumulation point, then that one accumulation point has to be the limit of the sequence. Can we show it? Will we show it? Stay tuned. <laughs>